Hi, this is Sapnil Bharti and we are here at the Open Source Summit and today we have with us Linus Torvalds once again. We... So, so how has things been in the Linux world, you know, anything? Uh... Uh, it's been pretty normal. I mean, our, f uh, our model of doing development really hasn't changed mm -hmm. now for over 10 years. So, um, it's... It's pretty standardized, and, and we right. continue to make releases about every two to three months. And obviously this year, the big change has been that in the last roughly a year, we've had all the hardware bugs that, that we had to spend a fair amount of effort for workarounds. And, uh, and that's been somewhat stressful, but I'm hoping, knock wood, <laughs> that we're starting to see the tail end of that. But that is not the problem of the kernel community. It's the hardware box, so there's nothing. Well, it has become, a, well, so it's not because of the kernel community, but the hardware bugs have been particularly problematic, I think, for the kernel community, just because, not just because the workarounds have to be in the kernel, but because the secrecy around them means that our normal workflow doesn't work. Uh, and it's, it's not just that we can't bring in everybody and talk about it on the normal kernel mailing list. It's also that we have a lot of open infrastructure for doing testing, for doing validation and, and things like that. And w we definitely have noticed that when you do development without all that infrastructure that we've gotten used to, uh, it's painful. So it has been a big issue for the kernel, this whole situation. Uh, and, and there has also been some software bugs as well. Well, but those aren't new. I mean, we've always had that. Right. Yes. I think what's maybe changed is that, well, that, not very recently, but over the last few years, people have gotten way more uh, vocal about security issues and people um, maybe, I wouldn't say take them more seriously, but there is more process in place mm -hmm. for them. But I mean, we've always had had the software bugs. The hardware bugs are just they're they're not new, but they're different for us for our workflow. Uh, I mean, this is not even a question, but Linux is an open source is everywhere these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but desktop is still, you know. But Google. One day. Well, actually, I mean, Chromebooks are getting pretty. You, you can run Debian uh, apps on Chromebooks now. They have started a project. Well, they've started. I'm not. I mean, Crouton has been around for a while, but now the official Google support for running Debian apps is starting to kind of trickle out. I haven't actually used it yet, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's pretty new. I only use Chromebooks for calendaring, so, but it's. it's it seems to be that, yeah, Chromebooks and, and Android are the path towards the desktop. But does, yeah, but does it really matter nowadays because we are doing most of the work in cloud and... I, I think it still matters. Um, I mean, I still, it's, a lot of people still use the desktop. Not everybody uses the cloud, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I still wish we were uh, better at at having a standardized desktop that goes across all the distributions. Uh, there's been some progress there. I mean, this is not a kernel issue, so this is just right. uh, like more of a personal annoyance how the fragmentation of the different vendors have, I think, held the desktop back a bit. Uh, but there has been some progress on that front too with Flatpak and things like yes. that. So. But the, yeah. I'm still optimistic, optimistic, but it's been 25 years. It's going to be <laughs> another few years at least. Yeah. Yeah, because even with the, with the flat pack, there's app image, and then there is, yeah. you know, so there is a, another yeah, sort of segmentation. Yeah, no, so. the desktop is not there yet. Because if there's one format, yes. then Linux will be treated as one platform, not multiple platforms that right. company have to support. And, and that may be what uh, Chrome, Chrome books end up doing, is that, Maybe that will turn into a de facto standard for, 
for desktop applications when, when Chromebooks start just running Debian packages or something. We'll see. Yeah, it will be more like Chrome versus the desktop environment and yeah. you're running, you know, so. Yeah, and uh, I mean, what I do, I would actually not mind having a Chromebook, but right now my main problem is even when you can run native Linux on Chromebooks with Crouton or, or something, you can't do the kernel testing, right. which is what I care about. Uh, so so it's, it's at the point where I can kind of see where I could use a Chromebook in a few years, mm -hmm. but not yet, yeah. but it's not there yet. Okay, let's talk about uh, uh, o open source uh, have kind of become the default Mm -hmm. For software development, and uh, so, but do you see any any risk that you know maybe companies will go back because we saw the Redis Labs where they changed the license? Do you sometimes feel that you know we might you know go back to the? I don't. So, from a development angle, I think people do realize how powerful it is to just have like open code and letting people be part of the development process. Right. So the only situation where you end up, I think, going back to uh, an old-fashioned proprietary model ends up being for niche products where, where you, you may have actually a hard time finding that general population that wants to help you. Um, so I don't think those matter. I, I think if, if you worry about just open source in general. You should worry more about the whole, when you do everything on the web and as a service, you can use that service with open source and a regular Chrome browser or something like that, but yeah. you're not seeing what's going on behind the curtain. Right. And, and I think that's, that's what a lot of people are more worried about and I, with reason that, that you can you can get into this situation where, okay, the software you run on your machine may be open source, but, but then if you, <clears throat> most of what you do ends up being in a proprietary cloud system anyway. Uh, and sticking to open source, uh, everything is part of, but at the same time, we are also building a serverless machine. Mm -hmm. where people, so do you, I don't know, uh, how much, you know, do you really care about just the code has to be open source or you also care about, you know, either the business practices? So, uh, me personally, I only care about the code. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I say that maybe a lot of people worry about the walled gardens and, and cloud providers and they, all the ownership of the data that you find with like the obvious Facebooks, Googles, Apples, whatever. Uh, that's not what I actually care about. It's not what I do. I do code. And uh, I'm just saying I understand that a lot of people who care about open source because of the whole traditional freedom thing, uh, they will find it much, I mean, worrying to how much is happening inside the walled gardens at big companies. And I actually don't think it's so much the code. The code is is often open source even in in a proprietary environment what the big companies have is they have all the data and uh, and that is obviously their bread and butter and i it, it makes perfect sense but but it's it's maybe a real issue right but you also come from europe you know they have but they left europe first they have different approach towards privacy i'm not talking the world garden i'm just talking about yeah. surveillance privacy but does that concern you today again i'm as, as a, i'm individual. personally uh pretty let's say fair okay I, I don't worry too much about my own privacy i'm a very public person i do all of my work in public <laughs> i have very little that i need to yeah. care about and and uh it's it's not something, I, I think it's inevitable. There's mm -hmm. going to be a lot of data. People are going to know a lot about you. People who worry about your DNA being available in various databases are correct. It's going to be available in a lot of databases. And right. even if you are careful, the fact that you have family members who weren't means that there's a lot of data about you. And I think that's a fact. And I, I don't think it's necessarily 
even a problem, but I think it can be problematic in certain circumstances. But I think the EU making the privacy rules stricter is something that eventually even the US will, will wake up to, right? Uh, so there will be that kind of protection, but let's face it, data is cheap. It's, and it's not going away. Right. Anybody who thinks it's not going, it's going away is just deluding themselves. Have you seen Black Mirror? Or not? You don't watch TV, right? No. Okay. No, no. So uh, let's, let's talk about you, know, you working in open. Uh, and you can also, because it's video interview, we could always check those parts off. If you, don't okay. want to, you know what I'm going to talk about. You know? well. So, so uh, do you ever wish you know, that there was some you know, small private LKML group where you can just, you know, like when you go to board meetings or when you listen to coaches telling their you know, players on the field, you know, they use all kinds of words. So, uh, because whatever you say becomes public and people pick it up and they don't know the context. Honestly, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have private mailing lists for security issues. We have private mailing lists sometimes for, actually, quite often it's not mailing lists. It's just when you have some issue come up and you just email a group of people because it's maybe not sensitive, but it's something that also you want to talk about. I mean, usually it's not code. Usually it's about maintainership issues, things like that. So we do have private email, but almost always when, when that happens, I find it to be problematic because then you don't end up having archives of it. Uh, you end up having to bring new people in and they are missing all the context. So I'm much happier just having all the discussion in, in the open. And uh, it doesn't always work that way. And it does mean that then when, when people get heated, that's in the open too. But I think that health, uh, that's healthier than, than trying to kind of say it doesn't exist. How does it affect you personally? When you get all mad and angry and you not a and lot, you're still in your actually. bathrobe. <laughs> uh, I actually so what happens to me is sometimes I get really it's and it's, uh, the reason I get upset is almost always the same is somebody's not acknowledging a bug that they introduced and trying to say hey we we don't need to I fixed the problem uh, never mind the fact that somebody's now complaining about the fact that I also introduced the problem. Um, but I occasionally explode and then I fire off an email and uh, then I forget about it. I mean, I don't, I don't tend to stay upset all that long. Uh, I have noticed that because there are like news people that follow my email and then write a story about the, the exploding ones that are fairly rare in the end, um, I have actively stopped responding sometimes. Mm -hmm. it, it needs to be something I really care about. So I've, I never respond a lot to email. I just get too much of it. Uh, but in the last few years, I've just decided, yeah, it's just less pain to not even respond at all sometimes. So it has resulted in me going quiet sometimes. Yeah. But it's it's not a huge issue. Respond to the press queries about it. No, or, I'm, I uh, actually I usually like talking to journalists, uh, responding to flame wars. Flame wars, exactly. Okay. On on the mailing list, I'm like, I want to respond, and then I decide, no, let's just <laughs> press delete instead. Right? It's not worth worth the pain. But it, it's actually fairly rare. I mean, I explode maybe once a year, mm -hmm. a couple of times a year. And most are just so. justified, mostly, you know? Well, I think so. <laughs> no, because people but, have to see the context. They don't look well, at the context. Well, that's, that's one of the issues is even if, even if it were justified, it's quite often that it, uh, people don't see, see the context. Exactly. And, uh, and then obviously the normal day-to-day -day stuff that doesn't generate flame wars also does not generate news so i mean that's but that's that's understandable that, that's, uh, that's not that's how that's how everything works and it's works. not about open source i mean this is how the whole politics, politics yeah, in the exactly. us right 
So what do you think in the, the, the okay, uh, we, we can once again check it out, but what do you think about the political landscape? I think you were said that may the best women win because I follow you on Google Plus uh, when the elections were there. What do you think about the current situation? If you don't want to talk oh, about Christ. it, we can ignore I, it. I, I don't know what to say about the whole US politics. I, I have to say I'm a bit ashamed of being in the US right now. And just leave it at that. But this too will pass. You're hopeful, you're, you're always pragmatic, so. I, I'm uh, fairly optimistic, optimistic and I think that this is a, it's a phase. aberration, I hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, uh, there has been any moment when you are like totally burned out after all these uh, flame wars, you're like, no, I'm done. I'm done with Colonel, I'll go and do something else. No, I've never been burned out in that sense. I mean, I, I, it happens commonly that I say, okay, now I, I mean, just the last merge window was fairly painful. So there was two weeks of not just the regular work of a merge window, which is my busiest time anyway, but there were issues going on anyway. And when I finally closed the merge window, I was like, okay, I'm gonna take a breather. But it's not like burnout kind of breather. It's more like, okay, it's good. I have a calm week coming up. I have some travel. I will just step back for a couple of days and then I'm fine again. But you it's, don't, do you travel a lot or you don't travel much? No, this was just this time. Uh, I don't travel very much for conferences. Mm -hmm. but, but my point is, even normally, I can just say, okay, I'm, I'll do something else for three days, right? And, uh, and uh, that's fine. It's, it's not the kind where I feel like this project is not worth it. It's more like, wow, okay, now I just need to have an extended weekend. Yeah, take a break from yeah. all the stress yeah. and everything, yeah. right? Um, and honestly, it's not that common. I mean, most of the time I'm not stressed. Mm -hmm. I am, I mean, we have a very working code flow. Uh, there is, even when I'm busy, it's seldom really stressful. It's more like, okay, now I need to sit in front of the computer from early morning to fairly late at night. Right. But that, that's the first week of the merge window. It's always like that. And that's normally not a big deal. Uh, so a couple of times a year, I get the feeling like, okay, that was, that was too much. Let's take a few days off. When you talk about a workflow, uh, uh, you have talked about it earlier also, uh, uh, the sustainability of the kernel community. I mean, right. uh, have you ensured that, you know, I mean, we want Linux to be there for thousands of years, you know, like Thanos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, have you ensured that uh, the kernel work will continue to go on, especially with the, you have set very high standards. I actually, no, we have a great, um, and we have a big community. I mean, the kernel is, when it comes to open source projects, it is, not just unusual, it's unusual in like being, it's a complete outlier. I mean, as far as I know, there are no other open source projects that literally have a thousand people participating in every release. And we have, I mean, hundreds of maintainers and, and a couple of tens of pretty high level maintainers. So, we got both the depth and the breadth of, of developers being involved. And I mean, people do go away, not every, I mean, I've been doing it for 27 years, years. Yes, whatever. Uh, and there are a couple of people who've been there for pretty much all that time, right? There are still people like that. But at the same time, there's also a lot of people, I mean, think of any work environment. Some people stay at their job for a couple of years and then they move on. And the same thing happens in the kernel. And, and I think that's normal and it would be odd if it didn't happen. But we have a lot of old time maintainers who, here's one walking by. Uh, Greg could take over if he wanted to. I'm actually more worried about Greg just burning out. Yeah. Last two weeks, I didn't yeah, like the last two weeks, him? but you must have really hated the last two weeks. Last two weeks, it's fucked so hard. Yeah, no. Was, yeah, no. That so was the fix every other. Should I get a chair for you? Day. Yeah. yeah you, you, I don't know if you're in. Yeah. 
He's joining us, right? <laughs> I think he's being a chair. Okay, let me just quickly <coughs> stop it and... So now we have, we have a whole super team here. Okay. Well, so what I... When I was saying that the last two weeks were pretty stressful because it was a bad merge window, I was like, and Greg was in a much worse situation because some of the things that made the last two weeks stressful on the stable side, they were a complete disaster. Yeah. So this is a bad couple of weeks. <laughs> so I had to deal with all the merges of all the stable, all the security stuff coming in, and then because we couldn't do everything in the open, um, all the corner cases were hit, and we started finding all these because everything's a corner case, right? So, like somebody said, so all these weird one. I have this old six-year-old box that has full amount of RAM, and it was crashing, and this other one was crashing. So we had a, I did a release like every other day for yeah. stable stuff, and having to merge all those patches and watch what's going into your tree at the same time, which made my pull request to you late <laughs> so yeah. um yeah it was the past two weeks were, were a lot of work so he said you know that, that you know once you know the, the whole merge window is over he takes a break what do you do so i normally take a break during the merge window <laughs> <laughs> just, just wait, wait, wait. Let, I, I have a new one microphone so let oh. me try to see that right this is this is crazy and prompt i love it oh. So I normally take a break during the merge window because everybody sends me stuff before then. It's all in this tree. It's all in my tree, so I just send it and you pull. Right. And then I can't take new things into my tree, so I get to relax. I watch what happens and stuff like that, and I start working on the stable stuff. But that's my two weeks okay. break. And so you're living in France, Paris, either way, so you just go out and No, no, no. I just and moved. I don't live there anymore, but yeah. Where did you move? I moved to The Hague. Oh, hey, oh, yeah. okay. same, same, yeah, same. Uh, I, I, miss, I miss Europe so much that I can, especially what is going on in this country, I yeah. may just, you know, go back very soon, <laughs> most probably Germany, let's see. Uh, so, uh, we talked about security. I think you, you guys can just talk to each other. I'll just sit there and moderate the No, no. I, I, we've talked about this issue before, right? Uh -huh. It's just, yeah, I, the last two weeks were unusually painful, and it normally doesn't happen very often. I mean, it's... I think this was the worst two weeks of the year. So well, the beginning of the year was bad. The, way, the beginning of the year was bad too. But this was this was really bad. But I mean, what we have so it was seventy patches that we were working for four months that nobody else could see. And I think that went pretty well, considering. It. Well, I mean, considering that there were only seventy patches, they weren't even that big. It was not like the meltdown patches, no, right? That's very true. And. Uh, it was okay in mainline, but I think we had so many issues in stable. Right? Yeah, the backports so, were, were crazy were tough. Bad, yeah. so. And that was not true of Meltdown, I think. Meltdown, I got to leverage the fact that the distros did the work. Uh -huh. And yeah. they did a lot of that stuff, and this wasn't that bad. Yeah. And I'm not just a cameraman. No. <laughs> <laughs> you say, you need to keep, no, no, keep the fine. questions coming. Because, yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. yeah. This, before that, I was talking to Dirk, and we talked about diversity. I don't know how important is that topic for you guys, because you do get a lot of, but still, you know, when we look at the kernel community, we still see, you know, uh, I don't want to use a very monotonous community. Does it worry you? We don't care that much. I have my own opinions on this, but. Yeah, so, uh, and as I said, um, I can take it out. If you don't feel comfortable, I can always take it out. Um. So there's two things here. There's, the odd thing is we don't go away. So, I mean, the one neat thing about Linux is we've been doing this for so long, we have the experience, we do it, and we yeah. don't go away. So we have like the old crowd of white male, and, but we are getting a lot of other people in. So people are working on that. We do have a long ways to go. But it's also hard to tell, we, since none of us are, know each other when you're accepting patches, who anybody is. And that's, that's good too. Um, I met somebody here, he's like, oh yeah, you, you took a patch from me when I was 12. I was like, I did? Yes. <laughs> so, I mean, I didn't, didn't know that. So, I mean, that's a good thing, too. But that being said, yes, diversity is very important. Different backgrounds, different stuff brings different things to the table, and we do need to work on that. Um, we participate in um, outreach program for, um, we do that every 
two times a year. So it's usually running continuously. We have lots of kernel projects for that. Google Summer Code is usually, these days, pretty much all people from um, either India or Asia are participating in that for our stuff, or Eastern Europe are doing really good for Google Summer Code. So yes, we are trying to do this and do good stuff. Outreachy, I think, is a really good example of a program that's working really well. Because almost everybody who goes through Outreachy um, gets a job. And um, there's people that are now working for ARM and other core, huge, large companies that um, started in Outreachy. So, uh, so one of the differences is also that you're not a company. You're not going to go out and hire people, right? It's a community. No. People yeah. come. So when people do ask about diversity, sometimes I feel that's not a... Because it's, it's more like, you know, you have an open park. Anybody can come. You're not hiring people, right? No, that's very true. So, uh, one of the issues is that, I mean, it's easy to talk about diversity, but at the same time, if you look at who gets involved, I mean, we, I mean, it's hard to find non-white males. It's, it is, I don't know, it's cultural. You know, part of it is history. Mm -hmm. Part of it is having access to computers. A lot of it is, I think, girls are discouraged from getting into the whole math and hard technical stuff. So there's a very small percentage coming in to us. But so. being fair, it's up to the companies too, because they're the ones that assign people to work on the kernel. Because almost everybody's just being told to do this stuff, so they're working on that too. But I mean, I was at IBM and on the kernel team was very, a large number of women at IBM. So it is there and they are participating. Sometimes you just don't realize it. Is there anything that worries you? It still worries you, hey, we still have to fix this problem or Anything keeps you like raised? I mean, I have talked to you about that. That you said, you know, that we are the only. If we can screw things up, you know, that's the only thing you worry about. But oh, as far as the future, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> what worries you the most? The technology doesn't worry me. Uh, I get worried about. I mean, I do worry about the community and about maintainership issues. Yeah. Uh, it's. There are certain people that I worry about burning out. Uh, it's not just Greg. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like David Miller is very central to the networking code. And sometimes he gets, he, I get the feeling that he is not burning out, but he gets frustrated. And, uh, and there, are, there are areas in the kernel where I worry about maintainership. But, on the whole, we've never actually had a big problem. The problems we've had have been when we needed to change, change the flow of patches and when we changed to BitKeeper and then to Git. That was really, really very painful. That was and, huge changes versus yeah. tiny incremental changes. Yeah, 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 those have been painful. But we've never really had huge maintainership issues, even though it's actually what worries me the most. So I've talked to a bunch of maintainers actually here um, about how to do that better. And people are working, Dan Williams who's a maintainer, parts of the kernel, um, he's working on a document to help other maintainers and trying to figure out how to do this better. Talk about co-maintaining um, subsystems and leaning on other people. And I talked to some people, one person who has a co-maintainer right now, he said it's the best thing ever. Because now he goes away for a week and he can lean on that or, and then lean on each other and that just working together really helps. So people are aware of this. We're working but there are uh, lots of frustrations. The oh, graphics yeah. people are still very frustrated. I don't know what's going on in, uh, on the GPU side, but I still hear like bad words from them. Their it's, maintainer model is crazy too. But they're, they're odd. They're, they're in a, their own world when it comes to the kernel maintainership, and, and I, I don't know what's going on there. But. Yeah. Yeah. So, so is it like you came up, you know, you realize a problem and you came up with some kind of structure? Because you're, is it like you focus more on the code itself or also the, the whole governance or organization model around it? So. so, none of this has really been planned. What's <laughs> happened is we've had, like, uh, we've had problem spots and they solved their issues. And different problem spots have generally solved them differently. Uh, we, the most noticeable one is probably ARM. That was a huge problem spot 10 years ago and has now been great. And they solved it by having a group of, of three plus people who do this group maintainership and it works really well for them. 
and uh, the group of engineers maintainership has worked in a few other areas and some people just can't do it. So it's, it's not like there's a one model fits all and there's no like, this is how you should do it. It's more like, this is what has worked. Yeah, and every, every development group, I mean, works differently. The graphics people work differently because most of them are employed by companies and they want to iterate faster over different things and their code is huge and crazy. And other ones are like, um, tiny ones like some of the security stuff is like there's very few patches, but those changes affect large subsets of things. So you have to spend a lot of time reviewing and testing these what would look like very small changes because they matter in a larger context. So that model group, other people reviewing it and spending time and whatnot is very different than other subsystems. So it all evolves differently because yeah. we all in the end work on the one solid thing, but it is a bunch of little different fiefdoms and stuff like that. So which gets when you start to make changes across all the areas, that turns into a hard problem. And yeah. that's a difficult thing to do. Uh, nowadays, we are also seeing Zephyr project and a lot of picture away from. I talked to Jonathan Holbert, like mm -hmm. bad last name. Yeah. I asked what is his worry, and he was like, these new projects which are coming up, which are kind of owned by companies, so they are not just with the, the new GPL, you know, with the Linux. So, do you worry about you? I don't personally. I, I'm like companies do what companies do, and they have all their upcoming projects, and and I'm like. Whatever, you do, you do your thing. And if you don't like the GPL and you decide to use another license and you don't like some project and you decide you need to create a competitor, and sometimes it's a competitor to the kernel, I'm like, you go, girl. It's all fine. We can compete. Yeah, and I want competition. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like, I want competition. like Monopoly, right? Almost. Absolutely. It's not a monopoly in that because it's free, you know, I know, but I mean, I, I want, I mean, competition's good. I mean, look at the GCC and Clang people now. The yeah. GCC developers are really happy that Clang is doing well. And if you look at that, that's sped up their development process. That wasn't process. always true. No, it wasn't always true, but <laughs> it, it's, it's helped them out and they yeah. have realized that and they're now bouncing ideas and, and I think everybody benefits from that. Yeah. But Zephyr is in a whole different problem space than what Linux is anyway. And I, yeah. I like the idea of Zephyr and it solves a problem that there, the, that area, there was no other real good solution. Right, I talked to the Zephyr project, you know, a couple of times. So they're solving a totally different, you know, yeah. real problem. Yeah, real tiny. But then that being said, there was a presentation by Microsoft showing how they've slimmed down Linux even tinier for some ARM systems. So we're really getting close to that edge of, well, maybe we really do just need to run Linux in these tiny things. Are you talking the Sphere OS? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. What are your thoughts about Sphere OS? I don't actually follow that. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that uh, most projects fail, right? And that's not true just of a project, but that's true of branching too, right? I, I, don't, I don't get too upset when somebody makes a branch and says, I will rewrite so-and-so. <laughs> and I'm like, good, go off and show us wrong, right? Uh, the problem with the tinification efforts, and there's been multiple, yeah, is that they usually end up doing a hatchet job where they just cut off pieces in ways that is not back mergeable. And so they go off for a few years and they cut off all the pieces they don't care about. And then we're in the situation where, yes, we'd like to be more modular and we'd like to be better at supporting a smaller model but the way you did it, we can't merge it because you basically just chop things off without trying to take the non-small case into account. Yeah, I mean, so with networking. networking, they did this let's hack up the network stack, yeah. we didn't need it all. And the response was, oh, that's great, the idea, but you gotta do it so it works for everybody. Yeah. And, that's where, and they rewrote that's, the TTY layer. That's, but like, they can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, and, make and it work for everybody. We've had that with schedulers too. Yeah, it's like schedulers. the scheduler is big and the scheduler is partly big because it's, pluggable, right? So if you want to make a small machine that has a much simpler usage case, one of the things you do is you get rid of all the pluggability because that costs you, right? But that also means that we can't merge the code back because we can't take just this stupid thing that <laughs> is good enough for you. So uh, a lot of these projects, it's, it's not worth my time really trying to figure out what they're doing. Only if it goes, gets to the point where, hey, you won, right? That's what kind of happened to Android, yeah. where Android did 
a lot of things that people disagreed with and, uh, and a lot of people were actually very unhappy. And I was like, I don't care. But then they won, right? So now we've been merging stuff back. Well, yeah, and, well no, but before that, like the locks, so they won, they showed that their model was actually really good. So yeah. people sat down and worked with them to come up with a mergeable solution for everybody. And that took a year and a half yeah, worth right. of work. And that was, it's not those worth doing work. ahead of time. No, yeah, that's definitely. what I'm saying. Because they proved that, that, yeah, that yeah. model actually worked. Yeah. And that's why we, these all these forks are great. Yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> Prove that, yeah, prove her wrong. <laughs> uh, is there any new use cases that you keep, because you keep seeing new use cases which keep coming in for Linux? I don't know if there are any left, you know, everybody using Linux. So. We haven't had anything really odd come up. I mean, I think the odd hardware is now doing stuff where the kernel isn't even involved anymore. So all the, UI, the AI people are, they're using their fancy AI hardware, but Linux is just not relevant in that space because it's basically a driver. Right. Yeah, we're just like, here's the pipe yeah. to that chip. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so we, we don't see a lot. I don't, we haven't had a lot of push. I think the tinyfication people are the ones that would be nice to get mainlined at some point, but I, don't, I just don't see it happening. So we'll see. Maybe somebody does it right. That would be great. Yeah. That would be good. And these days, Kubernetes is becoming very, very popular. People start saying, you know, the Kubernetes is the Linux of the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the Linux in the cloud is still Linux. You know? yeah. <laughs> so, so what do you have to say about that? Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's funny when people say it's the Linux of XYZ. It just means that it's the dominant project in some area, or that's at least what they want to say. Uh, it's it doesn't really have anything to do with us. Yeah. Like serverless is fun to watch, but there really isn't. It is a server out there running Linux somewhere. Right, so right. <laughs> just not my server, right? It's exactly. somebody else's yeah, server. There's a server and serverless, you know? Yeah, it's just exactly. This is not yours, yeah. Uh, what else should we talk about? We covered a lot of broad topics, and I don't want to do a necessarily controversial topic because that's garbage, I don't like it, right? What not? No, I mean, anything else uh, you would like to touch upon? I don't have, I mean, I don't have anything I want to really bring to the masses. The unwashed masses need to know. <laughs> okay, right. so let's, let's, I, mean, I won't talk about controversial, but just you know, like, you know, there was an issue with NVIDIA, you know. So is there any is still issue you face with the hardware in the personal capacity that you're like, oh, I wish that oh, was better? Oh, we're so much better off hardware-wise. I mean, we still have pain points, and they still are a lot of the time. It's the same usual suspects. You have a million new SOCs coming out, and getting support for them is it's an uphill struggle. And most of the time, the hardware manufacturers don't care because for them, it's throwaway hardware. They know that two years from now, it will be completely different. So they don't even bother to spend so much time upstreaming things. They're getting better. They're getting they do, better. But it's still 2.5 million lines of code outside. The, it's Linux-like. Right. What I'm, I'm hoping is going to change, and we've seen this in other areas, is uh, people just standardize. The, the SOC people get, it gets too expensive to just make 100 different versions of SOCs. So you end up having just four or five main families. And that's happened, yeah. that happened to SCSI, that happened to Sound, that happened to, it's happened a lot over the history of the kernel. And I think it's happening now to the ARM SOCs too. And then they get the plug-in SO, um, IP blocks for different buses, yeah. and it turns out everybody uses the same IP block. This is a little tiny tweak, so instead of having 10 drivers, you have one yeah. with all configurations. That's getting better. Uh, we have been hearing a lot about security in Linux in our group. Is it because a lot of people are using it in new use cases? Is it because you know it's been used in such use cases where it makes it a very liberating you know uh, target to attack, or it's you guys are becoming more and more you know kind of not this you know. So I think it's uh, education. So I know there's one major industry right now that got a huge wake up call when they realized that their um, in one country their networks were infiltrated, right? And all of a sudden they were they were their industry was used to physical security to protect themselves, but then they realized wait we're all digital stuff, yeah. and now we need to actually pay attention to this stuff. I think it's just more of an education process. If you look at the security people, they've been saying the same thing for 20 years. It's just now it's with, it's hitting home more and more and more, I think. So um, this, it's the same issues we've had for the past 20 years. 
I think so. I don't know. I mean, that's my opinion why it seems more prevalent now. It's just a more awareness, finally. So the, the message is finally sinking in. Yeah, I was talking to Martin Michels, and he said the beauty of open source world is that uh, the strength and weaknesses both are out there, and we are actually, because we are also openly able to talk about our the bad things and weaknesses as well, not just the good. Mm -hmm. So you can, you know, because everything is publicly mailing list, you know. So if you have a vulnerability, you talk about that too publicly. I, I actually think a big part. I don't. I don't necessarily agree about the education as much. Well, maybe they're related. It's just the news cycle when it comes to to technology in general. I think maybe because technology isn't changing so much anymore. Um, the I'm seeing just the tech news sites take security issues way more seriously. That's true. It sells. That, no? It it, it does sell, but it's also I think. Uh, let's say 10 years ago, you wouldn't even talk about security when it came to Windows because it just wasn't an issue. Right? Yeah. But if you read but, the whole thing, you'll, you will need physical access to the machine, but nobody would talk about yeah, that. Well. Or you know, you, you should have you know, side-loaded an Android app, nobody would talk about that. One million Android devices vulnerable, but you know. Yeah, and well, that's part of the, the whole PR problem where, where, yeah, it sells and you don't need to really, you, have a real security issue, it's, it's if enough if you have something that you can make a big stink about. Yeah, so some security issues aren't as bad as they are made out to be. And some but, people, like uh, in the security industry, I mean, we both complained about that. You complained about it a lot. They are attention seekers and that they want to, you make a logo for your bug that you announced or something. And sometimes it's not even a big issue at all. Right. Like the whole GPG email thing. That was a perfect example. There wasn't a problem and our configuration in this odd way. It wasn't that GPT was not properly encrypting your email. Um, people like theater in order to drive consulting stuff and like that, or they just like theater. <laughs> and that's the whole, yeah, make a website and have a cool logo. That's yeah. new in the last year. Yeah, that is, yeah, ever so since Heartbleed, right? Yeah. 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 New sites will pop up just for one thing and they generate a lot of page views and revenues. And yeah. yeah, and we've even been spoofed. That's even been spoofed, too. Yeah. Or well, fake there was ones. the AMD oh, the fake one. Yeah. one. Yeah, it wasn't, technically it wasn't fake, but it was seemed yeah. to be a pump and dump thing. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, this is something, it could be an uncomfortable question, but when sometimes when he explodes on, you know, LKML, what do you feel, you know? How do I feel? <laughs> la, 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 la. <laughs> there, but the grace of God go I. Um, no, Actually, I don't. it's being Greg who's been getting uh, news lately. Yeah, so. <laughs> I've been gotten news for complaining about stuff. Really? Well, that whole, the, the talk I, I gave about, it, about Spectrum Meltdown, right? Oh, yeah. So uh, it's the same exact talk I gave in China and Japan in public. It's been on YouTube. It's public. But there was actually a reporter in the room who made a sensationalist headline or somebody made a, a pretty headline, and that was funny. Um, luckily, I mean, it wasn't anything that, I have, that none of us have said in the past, so. So are you becoming an influence, like kind of becoming a bad influence on it? No, it wasn't, I no, wasn't, no. 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 <laughs> I, I'm, I'm saying, I think uh, what you kind of see from the outside is not, not actually yet. what the community sees mm -hmm. internally that much. Yeah, I mean, what we do, and also, I mean, what we do is also everything in public you can read. I mean, people do troll the mailing list to see what we post. And if you say something bad, yeah, that's a good news cycle for a day. And certain sites can get a click or two. But I mean, the majority of everything we do is sane. And yeah, as normal. you mentioned last time, you know, if you, the coach and the players when they play. Yeah, you're not putting, a, you're not putting a mic on a, on a professional man baseball manager's lapel when he's cursing at his players, oh, too. <laughs> it has. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just different too. And we also all are people, I've blown up at times too. Yeah, we all do. But, uh, so I think, I think we, I mean, we can just sit and talk all day, but I think we have. You have enough. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. And, uh, I think, yeah, cool. we, I think we have talked about it. And we also switched the mic to you, oh, yeah. to you. So <laughs> it has become half your show. No, I didn't mean to. <laughs> oh, I still got to come back. <laughs>